first of all, let me thank uh, Jesse, Brent, and Matteo for uh, putting together uh, what I think is a, a great initiative. I'm very excited to be uh, part of this. And together with uh, Wenjin and Adrian, uh, we'll be kicking things off by talking about currency markets uh, this morning. And what I'm going to do is sort of provide you a big picture overview of um, the research that's been happening sort of at the frontier of asset pricing uh, and international finance and thinking about exchange rates. And uh, in some sense, uh, you could you could argue that uh, what we've seen here is sort of a, a giant exercise in intellectual arbitrage, but I think it's it's paid off. And, and so hopefully I can get you excited about uh, what we've learned over the past few decades and thinking about exchange rates, taking uh, an asset pricing perspective. Um, the starting point um, of um, my introduction is going to be that currency markets and bond markets are are obviously tightly uh, connected. And in fact, a big part of what exchange rates have to do on a day-to-day -day basis is to sort of continuously adjust uh, to make sure that uh, returns are kind of aligned uh, with risk, both for domestic bond market investors and foreign bond market investors. And once you take this perspective, you, you kind of quickly see that um, exchange rates and currency markets are going to be priced much in the same way as stocks are priced in equity markets, and they're going to reflect a bunch of different forces. Exchange rates are going to have to absorb shocks to future interest rates, and you can sort of think about that as the, the cash flow component uh, that accrues to uh, an investor who takes a long position in foreign currency. It's also going to reflect news about future discount rates, and these are deviations from uncovered interest rate parity. In other words, foreign currency risk premia. That's the second force. And then there's potentially a third force that is going to come into play, which is deviations from covered interest rate parity, uh, parity excuse me, and that's going to reflect things like convenience yields uh, because of safe asset demand, balance sheet constraints, um, that are uh, experienced by uh, financial intermediaries. Uh, Matteo already alluded to that in his introduction. All of these three different forces together will jointly sort of determine um, the level of exchange rates. And so the way we've organized things is I'm going to sort of broadly outline this framework to think about exchange rate determination. Adrian is going to focus on deviations from uncovered interest rate parity and foreign currency risk premia. That's going to be the second part of today's session on FX markets. And then Wenjin is going to come in and talk about uh, deviations from covered interest rate parity. And she's obviously uh, an expert on this and has done quite a bit of research on this very topic, both with Adrian and with, uh, with Jesse, one of the co-organizers of of this initiative. Okay. What we're going to find, what's going to come out of this at the end of the day, is we're going to find that uh, shocks to discount rates, um, deviations from uncovered interest rate parity, uh, are actually responsible for a large share of variation exchange rates. If you understand variation exchange rates, these shocks to discount rates are going to be particularly important. And, and this force is something that we've only really um, studied carefully in the past few decades. So that's kind of the sea change relative to uh, the work that's come before. Okay, so let me jump right into it. I'm going to start uh, by outlining what the relation is between the exchange rate today and short-term interest rates. Um, and once we've done that, I'm going to switch gears and talk about the relation between exchange rates today and long-term interest rates. Um, and then the third part of the discussion is going to focus on exchange rates and deviations from covered interest rate parity. As I said, I see my job here as sort of mostly uh, being the warm-up act for Adrian and Wenjin, so I'm not going to go into too much details about the data and the empirical evidence. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Wenjin and Adrian do the hard work um, Please stop me if um, something's not clear or if you have questions. What I want to do uh, to derive this relation is sort of go back and start from the basics. We're going to look at the uh, 
Euler equation of a foreign investor with a pricing kernel or stochastic discount factor M star who's thinking about taking a long position in US bond markets. If she does so, she can earn a yield Y dollar on that long position in treasuries. Uh, she could alternatively decide to invest in her domestic bond market earning um, a yield Y star, okay? Uh, we're gonna enforce both of these Euler equations and then explore what that tells us about the exchange rate. Note that the exchange rate plays a prominent role in that first Euler equation. Uh, S here denotes the exchange rates in units of local currency per unit of foreign currency. So an increase um, means an appreciation, okay? What we're gonna do is we're gonna take these two Euler equations and sort of work out the implications uh, for the exchange rates to keep things simple. This is not essential, but we wanna keep it sort of simple and tractable. We're gonna assume a joint log normality of exchange rates and the pricing kernel. Uh, lower case symbols here are gonna denote logs, okay? And so if you, if you work out the math for these two Euler equations, you're gonna get uh, two fairly standard uh, expressions um, that involve the mean of the log stochastic discount factor, the conditional variance, uh, and a covariance term, uh, which is the risk premium. So the currency risk premium is gonna be minus the covariance between the foreign log stochastic discount factor and the rate of appreciation. Okay. All right, so now if you, um, if you combine these two Euler equations, uh, a bunch of things cancel out. And what you end up with is the following intuitive expression, which says that um, the uh, rate of expected appreciation of the dollar plus the interest rate that a foreign investor uh, will uh, capture when she's going long in dollars and short in domestic currency. So that's Y dollar minus Y star. That is the log uh, currency risk premium, okay? Uh, now you can rewrite this equation uh, as a difference equation for ST, for the dollar exchange rate. Uh, the dollar exchange rate is on the left-hand side in that equation, and now it's gonna reflect uh, the future exchange rate, again, in logs, plus the interest rate difference, minus that uh, currency risk premium. This is kind of the central equation. What you can do here is you can keep iterating on this equation and sort of roll it forward. <clears throat> what comes out of that is what I'll call the fundamental exchange rate valuation equation, which says that the dollar exchange rate, um, and so here we're looking at the dollar in terms of foreign currency per dollar, is gonna reflect future interest rate differences uh, minus future currency risk premia plus this sort of nuisance tail term, uh, which reflects um, the, your expectation today of the exchange rate in the distant future, okay? This equation was sort of originally um, derived by Campbell and Clarita back in 87, but was really uh, used um, uh, more recently by Fruit and Romotori um, to sort of think about the determinants of exchange rates. Key thing to point out here is that this actually will hold uh, very generally. So note that we really haven't made too many assumptions about the market structure. All I've assumed is that these bond investors Euler equations hold both for the foreign um, bond and for the US treasury. Uh, but other than that, I have really haven't made any assumptions, particularly I'm not assuming that markets are complete, so I'm not imposing that the foreign stochastic discount factor equals the domestic stochastic discount factor times the ratio of exchange rates. This uh, is only the case if you uh, assume that markets are complete, and Adrian will come back and talk more uh, about that. So this, this equation here is, is much more general than that. There's really two main forces here that we need to think about. Um, the dollar exchange rate today is gonna reflect a cash flow term 
and a discount rate term. The cash flow term in blue is the difference between short-term interest rates in all future periods. It's the dollar interest rate minus uh, the foreign interest rate. Okay. Um, and the discount rate component, that's that currency risk premium. That's the deviation from short-run UIP. So if you were to impose uncovered interest rate parity, the red stuff would disappear from this equation. And you'd only be left with uh, these interest rate differences and the tail. Okay, so let's kind of think about what this means um, in terms of, you know, how changes in interest rates will affect the dollar exchange rates. Well, what you can tell by staring at this equation is that the dollar will tend to appreciate. That is to say, ST uh, will go up when U.S. interest rates in the future um, are expected to increase. Um, that's very intuitive, as we said, for a foreign investor who takes a long position in the dollar, the cash flow component is exactly that interest rate difference she's harvesting. And so if you're going to increase uh, U.S. interest rates, uh, that means that the cash flows um, are going to go up. On the other hand, if you increase the uh, risk premium that a foreign investor demands for holding dollar currency risk, um, that's actually going to push the other direction and that's going to cause uh, the dollar to depreciate. Okay, So these are kind of the two uh, main forces that are going to uh, determine exchange rates quite generally. So the key thing to realize is that this fundamental exchange rate valuation equation is going to hold across a very large class of models, both complete and incomplete market models, and even models in which markets are somewhat segmented, Okay, which recently uh, we've seen quite a bit of work on that in currency markets. So it's quite, quite general. Okay, And just sort of intuitively, um, it's kind of interesting to think about say a country like Switzerland or Japan that, that sort of has um, consistently low interest rates. So now let's switch gears, take the perspective of uh, say the yen versus the dollar or the Swiss franc versus the dollar. So what's gonna be the determinant of the yen exchange rate? Well, it's gonna be that interest rate. So it's gonna be yen interest rates minus dollar interest rates minus the currency risk premium. And what you can sort of tell from staring at this is that, well, if, if Japanese interest rates or Swiss interest rates are gonna be consistently lower uh, than US interest rates, uh, then in order for the exchange rate to sort of be stationary, that's gonna have to be offset by small or even negative uh, currency risk premium, right? Uh, and that is kind of what you see in the data. You see that there are persistent interest rate differences, and Adrian will document this at length across developed and emerging market countries, um, but they seem to be mirrored uh, by offsetting uh, foreign currency risk premium. And so what the Swiss and the Japanese effectively have done is they've, con they've convinced Currency market investors, well, yes, we offer lower interest rates. That's true. Uh, and that's probably going to be true in the future. But we're safer currencies for you to invest in. We have potentially a negative beta. Conversely, high interest rate currencies, uh, they're perceived to be riskier um, by bond market and currency market investors. And they tend to earn higher risk premium. Okay, So you get this sort of nice offset uh, between these two uh, components in the exchange rate valuation equation. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the key uh, exchange rate valuation equation that I want you to keep in mind as uh, we go through uh, the first session and you go through uh, the material that Wenjin and Adrian will present. Second thing I want to do uh, is, is sort of uh, address the following obvious question. Well, you've, you've sort of seen now what the relation is between exchange rate today and short-term interest rates. What can we tell you about long-term interest rates? Um, well, it turns out using the exact same logic, you, you can actually derive a, a simple relation between exchange rates today and future long rates. Okay. Um, 
So now we're going to sort of modify that fundamental exchange rate valuation equation, and we're going to decompose the exchange rate today into a long rate component. That's going to be the cash flow component. Uh, so instead of short rates, we're going to now going to look at long rates. There's going to be a second component that captures deviations from short run UIP uh, as before, but now there's going to be a third component which captures deviations from the expectations hypothesis in bond markets. So if you go back to uh, sort of um, your basic finance, um, you'll remember that the expectations hypothesis sort of says that uh, if investors are risk neutral in, in bond markets, uh, then the expected excess return on a bond of any maturity ought to be zero, right? So it's the equivalent of uncovered interest rate parity in currency markets. Um, and uh, what I'll show you, and this is kind of, I think, a neat and intuitive result uh, based on some of the work that I've done uh, with Adrian and Andreas Totopoulos, and also some work that uh, um, Mike Chernoff's done with uh, Nina Boyarchenko and, and Dave Backus. When exchange rates are stationary, um, so when there's no long-run risk in exchange rates, when they kind of revert to a mean, uh, then the second and the third component will always have to cancel out, and you get to something that we'll call long-run uncovered interest rate parity. Okay, um, so that's going to be what comes out of this. So this is the only part where you have to bear with me. This requires uh, um, a couple of steps, uh, but but they're actually fairly obvious. And and so if if this uh, goes by too quickly um, for you, please stop me and we can, we can sort of uh, spend a bit more time on it. I want to think about bond risk premium real quickly now. Uh, we're going to define the log holding period return on a maturity and bonds. These are zero coupon bonds, just as the difference between the price tomorrow or next period of the bond minus the price today. Of course, next, next period, the bond has a maturity of N minus one. Uh, to keep it simple, you could think about uh, the maturity as being denoted in years here. Well, if you look at the definition of the holding period return, and this goes back to work by Campbell and Schiller, by the way, then it, you see that you can iterate forward again to express the log price of the bond today as minus the sum of the holding period returns that an investor is going to earn over the maturity of this bond. So if this were a 10-year bond, you look at the holding period returns over the next nine periods um, that this investor would earn. Similarly, we can derive an expression for the, the yield as the average holding period return over the maturity of the bond. Okay, so now why is this useful? Well, what we can do now is we can say, okay, I'm going to look at excess returns, the holding period return minus the short-term interest rates, and now I can write that sum of short-term interest rates, which we care about because that's what I had in the fundamental exchange rate valuation. I'm gonna, I can rewrite that as um, long-term yields minus bond risk premia, okay? And I'm gonna plug that into uh, the blue component of the fundamental exchange rate valuation, right? So I have a new expression for that first term in blue, uh, by substituting uh, for the sum of the interest rates. And what you get then is actually fairly intuitive. Okay, so bear with me here. Uh, I know this was probably um, a lot to digest, but I think what you'll see here is going to make perfect sense. So the dollar exchange rate now is going to reflect not short-term interest rates, but the long-term interest rate difference. Okay, so it's going to reflect the difference between, say, the yield on a 20-year U.S. bond and the yield on a 20-year German bond, okay, plus the difference in bond risk premia, okay, uh, that's that second term, and I've labeled that deviations from the expectations hypothesis, um, those will come into play, um, and then there's the third term that you're familiar with, which we had before, was deviations from short-run UIP, okay? The last term, that one's just gonna converge to the unconditional mean if the exchange rate's stationary. So now we've got 
a relation between exchange rates and log and long yields. Okay. Um, what does this mean? Well, you know, let's sort of go over the different forces that are driving the exchange rate here. This says, look, the dollar is going to appreciate when the long yields at the long end of the yield curve go up today relative to foreign yields. That's intuitive. That's sort of like the cash flow component um, becoming more appealing for a foreign investor. The dollar is also going to appreciate when the local currency U.S. bond risk premium, uh, which enters uh, with a minus sign, uh, goes down. Okay, so that's that Rx dollar N minus J component. That's also intuitive. And it's going to appreciate when future dollar foreign currency risk premia, the term in red, decrease. That's the force that we talked about uh, before. So now you can, you can sort of see that um, currency markets and bond markets are, are really intertwined, right? And that bond risk premia are going to have sort of a direct effect on, on the exchange rate. And now the interesting thing that I wanted to draw your attention to, um, and hopefully this will um, help you develop some intuition, is suppose now that you thought exchange rates are stationary. And in particular, when you're thinking about the real exchange rate, uh, that seems to be uh, a natural assumption. And some of the speakers later on in this program will come back to that. It's natural to think that real exchange rates sort of revert back to some long run mean. That being the case, um, you can show that the second and the third component are actually going to exactly cancel out and that the only thing you end up with is sort of the deviation of the dollar exchange rate today in deviation from some long run mean is just going to be pinned down by long-term interest rate differences between, say, the U.S. and Germany, okay? So you kind of get this exact offset. Well, why does that happen? Let me try and give you the intuition for that. Well, you essentially get long-run uncovered interest rate parity being restored, and that sort of has to happen because if exchange rates are stationary, then in the long run, there's no risk for, for an investor, no additional risk from investing in a U.S. bond relative to a foreign bond, and hence it's as if in the long run that investor is sort of risk neutral, and lo and behold, you sort of get back to long run uncovered interest rate parity. Okay. Now, why am I spending time on this? Well, this is actually a bit more than sort of a theoretical interest. Why? Well, because first of all, we tend to think, especially if you're thinking about real exchange rates, that this is a reasonable uh, description of the data for a large set of currencies. Um, but there's also evidence to suggest, actually, if you look at currency markets, that high currency risk premia are offset by local currency bond risk premia, and that long-run UIP is sort of a good benchmark uh, model uh, to think about exchange rates. And in fact, recently, there's work by uh, Gurren Shah, Ray Vianos, and Greenwood, Hansen, Stein, and Sundaram, uh, that, that sort of b builds models that implement uh, a version of long-run UIP. And there, there's references um, to the literature if you're interested at the, uh, at the back of the slides. Real briefly, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because I don't want to steal Adrian's thunder, but it, it does seem to be true that in the cross-section, um, there's no currency carry trade to be earned. That is to say, if you're going to go long in longer maturity bonds uh, of countries that have high interest rates, uh, let's say Australia, and short um, longer maturity bonds of countries that have low interest rates, like Japan or Switzerland, uh, that is actually not going to give you a large excess return. Why not? You're probably thinking, well, it's because the foreign currency risk premium, uh, which is low or negative for the Japanese yen, is going to be offset by a higher term premium, okay, or a bond risk premium that's higher. Uh, 
Similarly, in Australia, what you tend to see is that the high currency risk premium that you get as an investor going along in Australian currency tends to be offset by a low um, or negative uh, bond risk premium. And so at the end of the day, chasing high interest rates at the long end of the yield curve doesn't seem to pay. And that is, as I said, that's consistent with the evidence in favor of long run UIP um, and long run purchasing power parity. Uh, as well. And there's earlier work um, by Meredith and Chin uh, and Budo Richardson and Whitelaw that sort of hints at the fact that long run a UIP is probably sort of a reasonable way uh, to think about what's going on um, in the data. So let's go back to this equation. What this equation kind of says is something pretty radical, right? It says, well, if you had yields at the really far end of the, the long end of the yield curve, they should sort of totally span exchange rates. They, if, you, if you ran a regression of changes in exchange rates on changes in these very long-term yields, uh, you should be able to explain all of the variation. That's not quite true. In fact, there's a recent paper by Mike Chernoff and his co-author Drew Creel that kind of shows that actually these R, R squares are, are probably on the low end. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, but bear in mind that if you believe in um, PPP, uh, and long run UIP, then long rates um, should really explain a lot of the variation in, uh, in exchange rates. Okay, real, brief, real quickly, I'm not going to go into too much detail here in the interest of time, but I just wanted to highlight that sort of the canonical um, asset pricing models that we have, let's say a habit model and a long run risk model, um, when they're adapted to sort of match moments of currency markets, this is one set of moments they're going to struggle with uh, quite a bit. Uh, you won't have this sort of long run uncovered interest rate parity driving an offset between bond risk premium local currency and currency risk premium, because in those models, you get permanent shocks to real exchange rates and deviations from PPP. They're sort of built in uh, to these models. And unless you shut those down, uh, you can't get that. Long run UIP is not going to hold because, well, there is long run risk in exchange rates in these models. Okay. Um, as I said, there's some more recent work, uh, for example, at the NBER, um, the Summer Institute, this work by Gorinchus et al. and Greenwood et al. that was presented that, that sort of um, delivers segmented bond market models. They don't try to price equities. Um, that actually doesn't suffer um, from this uh, particular problem, um, and that sort of enforces long-run UIP. Just intuitively, how, how does all of this work? Think about an increase in the supply of long bonds in the context of a model like that. Well, what happens there is that U.S. arbitrageurs uh, demand a larger bond risk premium because they're forced to hold more risk now. That's going to drive an increase in U.S. dollar long yields, then the U.S. dollar is going to appreciate right away uh, to offset the effect of the higher dollar yields, right? So that's consistent with that equation that I just showed you. Just in terms of magnitude, suppose that the 20-year yield goes up by five basis points. Then we expect a five basis point per annum um, appreciation of the dollar over the uh, over the next uh, depreciation excuse me of the dollar over the next 20 years which means that the US dollar is going to appreciate by 100 basis points now how does this all work out well the way this works is as i sort of hinted at the increase in bond risk premium in the US is going to be completely offset from the perspective of foreign investors by decrease in foreign currency risk premium, okay? Um, and the intuition is that, well, in the long run, the foreign investor here doesn't need a higher return for holding long US dollar bonds because there's no long run risk. She understands that the dollar is just gonna mean revert back uh, to its long run mean in the long run, okay? So, so these sort of newer classes of models impute an important role for quantities and flows in determining exchange rates. Um, and of course, there's other work, for example, work by Xavier Gebex and Matteo Maggiore that, that sort of uh, similarly imputes a role for 
for quantities and flows and exchange rate determination, which more standard neoclassical complete market models didn't have. Um, okay. So that was a bit of a detour to think about the relation between exchange rates and long yields. Now let me conclude um, by thinking about exchange rates and convenience yields, which is kind of the third major force that I wanted to highlight um, in the determination of the exchange rate. And then, um, and then we're done. Okay. So let's go back to the Euler equations we started from. Remember, uh, that first equation is the Euler equation of a foreign investor who's thinking about going long in U.S. Treasuries. But now let's assume that this investor gets a convenience yield lambda dollar star from a long position in Treasuries. Okay, um, And we're going to think that that lambda dollar star is, is pretty big. Um, that German investor or that Italian investor has particular safe asset demand for dollar denominated safe assets and U.S. Treasuries are kind of the best game in town when it comes to uh, safe assets, okay? You go through the same steps, uh, but now you have these convenience yield terms, these lambdas floating around. You do the same math that we did before where you iterate on this different equation and you iterate it forward, and now you come out with sort of an amended fundamental exchange rate valuation, which has a new component in green, and that is the difference between the convenience yields a foreign investor gets from a long position in treasuries, lambda dollar star, and the convenience yield she gets from a long position in, say, German bonds, which is lambda dollar dollar. Okay, and so as the perceived convenience yields in the future from treasuries go up, the dollar is going to appreciate. That's quite intuitive, right? What you want to do to sort of restore equilibrium is when that foreign investor gets a higher convenience yield from holding treasuries, um, you want the dollar to appreciate right away to generate an expected depreciation in the future and lower, thus lower the perceived return for that foreign investor from holding a long position in dollars, right? Um, so just to summarize, we're now sort of um, back where we started, uh, but we've got this uh, additional new component uh, that reflects deviations between convenience yields earned on treasuries and convenience yields earned on whatever the foreign equivalent is, okay. Now, of course, this equation is sort of not that helpful unless we have a good way of measuring what those convenience yields are exactly. Uh, and this is where I'm gonna lean on some recent work by uh, Wenjin and her co-authors, in particular, Jesse, uh, as well as some work that I've done uh, with Zhen Ying Zhang and Arvind Krishna Murthy. If investors earn differential convenience yields in treasury markets, then CIP cannot hold. That's kind of intuitive, right? Because if you get these non-pecuniary benefits from holding U.S. treasuries that you don't get when holding bonds, then there's no sense in which covered interest rate parity ought to hold. In fact, you're going to get deviations from covered interest rate parity. And that deviation is going to help us pin down um, exactly what um, lambda dollar minus lambda star is, okay? In particular, the treasury basis, and Wenjin is going to talk in a lot more detail about this, um, you can define it as the difference between the yield on a cash position in treasuries and the yield on a synthetic treasury that you construct from a German bund but you hedge the risk, okay? Um, the idea is that the cash treasury position from the perspective of that German investor is really a lot more appealing, offers more convenience yield than a foreign government bond, and that the basis is gonna reflect that, right? So if you increase land a dollar, um, that's gonna show up as a more negative basis that is going to lower the cash yield on U.S. Treasuries relative to uh, the synthetic yield on a, on a Treasury that you've constructed 
uh, by using the German Bund. And so what you can do is sort of use the CIP deviations and kind of plug them in there, in that green uh, term right after the equality sign. And, and so you can give empirical content to the notion that safe asset demand is going to drive um, the rate of appreciation of the dollar. And there's some evidence um, we found in, in, in our work that, in fact, when investors think convenience yields go up, uh, that that's going to be reflected in an appreciation of the dollar. Um, interestingly, Matteo uh, talked a little bit about this, um, and Wenjin will come back to this, but during the recent uh, COVID crisis, this force hasn't been quite as strong as it was during the financial crisis. Big component of why that is is probably these swap lines that the Fed sort of immediately uh, put into place. They're quite large um, to the tune of, of half a trillion, if I'm not mistaken, to alleviate the shortage of dollars uh, and presumably uh, sort of mitigate the impact of lambda dollar uh, on the dollar exchange rate. Okay. Let me briefly conclude by sort of outlining that once you have this equation in place, you can think about things like quantitative easing. How is that going to affect the dollar exchange rates? Well, then you have to sort of try and sort through how is that going to affect uh, these convenience yields, right? When uh, the Fed buys treasuries, is that going to increase the convenience yields because you're creating scarcity? Um, these are all things that you can think through and you can use this equation sort of logically to sort out uh, all of these impacts. So I'm, I'm actually just about um, out of time. So I think this is a good point for me to conclude where I started, which is I uh, hope I've convinced you that this sort of asset pricing view um, of exchange rates is kind of useful. And it really outlines three major forces um, that um, Adrian and Wenjin are now going to talk about uh, in more detail. The first one is sort of the cash flow component. That's the standard component that much of international finance was thinking about um, until a few decades ago. Recently, we've done a lot more work trying to understand the second component, uh, discount rates. And then much more recently, over the past two, three years, I'd say we're thinking more deeply about deviations from covered interest rate parity, which will reflect convenience yields, but also um, binding um, balance sheet constraints for financial intermediaries and other forces, and Wenjin will uh, tell you much more about this.